uh, integrative physical therapy clinic. Um, and I'm gonna be giving a talk on how to optimize your athletic performance with nutrition. This is in line with the weight loss challenge you have going on, but my intent is to help facilitate more long-term lifestyle habits that you can sustain beyond this challenge. Um, we will be doing, I'll try to stop like halfway for questions, but if you have like a burning question that you feel like you need to ask, go ahead and raise your hand and um, I will get to that. So first, let's talk about what the requirements are to have an optimal athletic performance. Um, you need to have strength, obviously. CrossFit is good for that, building strong muscle. You need endurance, depending on the type of athletic performance you're gonna be doing. Mental clarity. I, I stress this a little bit because I find that one of my biggest challenges with CrossFit has always been um, that mental focus because you're performing a technical move and you have to count your repetitions and then sometimes you have to talk to your partner about keeping track of where you're at and then you gotta count the rounds that you're doing. So it's important to be able to have a clear mind to keep track of those things because otherwise you might lose your form and cause injury. Um, but I also wanna talk about, and we're gonna kinda focus on these last two points a little bit um, as it relates to nutrition, because I think it's really important and probably the most critical piece to optimizing your performance, is you need to have a healthy immune system. Obviously, if you're going to get exposed to different bacteria and bugs, you need to be able to have your body do what it needs to do um, to respond to that. Um, but you also need to have a normal inflammatory repair response, particularly for CrossFit, right? Because we're often regularly, uh, in a controlled manner, inflaming ourselves from a mechanical standpoint. Um, but you need to have a normal inflammatory response to be able to repair, and particularly if you have an injury. Which brings me to my next, oof, my next um, slide here. So I'm gonna have everyone grab a penny. We're gonna get friendly with this penny for a moment. I want you to just take a look at the penny. Seems a little bit silly. And what, what, what do you notice about it? Dirty. Okay, it's dirty. Minted in 2012. Round. It's round. Are everyone's the same or different? Oh, the same size. They're the same size. They're worth about the same amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe unless you have a mint penny that was a specific year that's never been touched, maybe it might be worth more. But it has two sides, right? But in the end, each penny is inherently the same even with its unique parts. You know, it was made in a different year, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go ahead and flip our coin. We're gonna throw it in the air and catch it, right? And then flip it over. Who, how many heads do we have? But shows? theoretically, it would be, in most cases, you would say each time you flip the coin, you got a 50% chance. But if we take this penny and call it inflammation, right? Everyone has an inflammatory response and you've, we've got two sides that are inherently associated with the same thing. So let's say we've got one side. So well, here's our 2013, it's an old one. Maybe it's worth more than, I don't know. But we've got local inflammation and then we've got on the other side, you have systemic inflammation. So two different pathways for inflammation that we're gonna talk about here for a moment. But what I want you to walk away from today is, is realizing that they are one and the same. They may start out differently, but they can have a similar impact. Um, when I originally, this idea, this analogy was um, given, developed by my colleague, Frank Glass, when we had given a talk earlier. And I really loved how it, we were trying to make the point that thing, we, the talk originally was on arthritis, joint pain. And what we found was, you know, obviously you can have a knee injury, a localized injury that can develop into an arthritic condition, but you can also have a systemic inflammatory condition that will present as a localized painful response. You know, our osteoarthritis has been linked to a lot of metabolic diseases. So that, that's what I'm gonna focus on for a little bit before we get into the nutritional stuff here. So the definition of inflammation, it's a local response to injury, you get 
when you have an injury, you get a blood flow to bring all the cellular um, equipment you need to initiate the repair and get rid of the debris, redness, heat, and you have pain. But some, you don't always have pain, but sometimes you have pain. Um, you have two different pathways, and this is coming back to our penny, right? Mechanical inflammation, which would be an acute or local injury. You get macrophages, neutrophils, C-reactive protein, and interleukin-6. I'm not gonna bog you guys down too much on the cellular details, but just to make the point that there is these two different pathways that kind of converge together. And then you have the physiological inflammation. You have a complement system, which is IgM and IgG, and you have a coagulation cascade, which is primarily through the blood, where your, your body's gonna send thrombin, fibrinogen, and those are gonna be working on clotting to prevent you know, bleeding out to death. Um, but these are the two primary, primary pathways. So let's talk about causes of local inflammation for a moment. Some of these are um, pretty obvious. I'm, I, I meant to take out the head trauma part of it, but let's just talk about trauma. Head trauma is a form of localized um, inflammation. Um, but trauma could be a specific injury, you know, a car accident, or you break something. But it also could be a strain. And in the world of CrossFit, like too many squats, which has been recently a problem here in this gym, <laughs> um, you could sprain your ankle, say. Um, this doesn't, I mean, I made this more um, geared towards CrossFit, obviously. But you're doing all your rope climbs, and you decide you're tired, or you fall off, and you sprain your ankle. Um, you could have a planned or unplanned sur surgery. And compensation is due to immobility. I, what I had originally had on this slide was somebody walking with a, with a walker, um, you know, because they had an injury, a total knee replacement. You know, and they, you could see them developing shoulder pain, right? Um, you could see this gentleman, something might happen because he's compensating for his form with his neck, um, neck brace. This, and then I found this one, which I really like as far as, um, a quick guide to the CrossFit battle scars, which actually are mostly localized inflammatory conditions, right? She's got the double under scars on her shins and her arms, right? Um, I see it so box jumps. Box jumps. <laughs> the power Skin's clean, going off the shin. Right? So, so CrossFit, you definitely got exposure to a lot of conditions that would put you at risk for localized inflammation. I'm not calling it all bad. I'm just saying that we've already got that component going. What's more interesting to me is the causes of the systemic inf inflammation and where I think that nutrition piece really comes into play. So causes of systemic inflammation are the chronic regular blood sugar regulation. And I think we were all kind of talking about that. That leads to the metabolic syndrome and can lead to conditions like obesity, diabetes, um, cardiovascular issues like hypertension and stroke. So all of those um, stem from chronic irregular blood sugar uh, regulation. <coughs> Another interesting one I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about is the chronic gastrointestinal disruptors. I don't know if you guys have heard of the leaky gut syndrome. That's a pretty hot topic recently, um, also known as dysbiosis. You could have the intestinal flora or microbiome disruption. They kind of all go together. They're not mutually exclusive. But we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But you can also have a systemic infection. And those are things like staph infections, other bacterial infections. That, that's a infl systemic inflammatory response. And those do require medical attention. Um, there are many bugs, this little slide here with the baby. You know, we've gotten into a society where we're not exposing our children to any of the normal bugs that, good, healthy bugs that actually help feed our healthy bacteria in our gut. So let's come back to the leaky gut dysbiosis and microbiome piece. This is a chart from the Paleo Approach by Dr. Sarah Valentine. Um, she wrote a book primarily for autoimmune diseases um, using that Paleo Approach. But I love her diagram. And if you look here, this is our cellular lining of our small intestines where there's the tight junctions. And this is a critical place where it determines what comes in our body, how we absorb the nutrients of the food that we are eating. But this is also a critical um, barrier of how we control what's coming in and where that systemic inflammatory process can be stimulated.
So we have the tight, ju tight junctions that keep things close together. And the thing, anything that disrupts that tight junction opens up that barrier, and then you lose that control about what comes in, comes into your body, right? And the things that disrupt that lining, we talk a little bit more about in a little bit, but are things like alcohol, excessive sugar consumption, refined carbohydrates and sugar. Gluten is one of those hot button topics too. Gluten tends to open those junctions, and then we don't know what unlocks them to reclose things up. Infections, certain infections can cause that. The disruption of that microbiome, those bugs, can end up leading to opening those junctions up a little more. Um, and certain medications, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the medications that can um, irritate that lining and lead to a leaky gut, like NSAIDs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Any questions about that? Yeah. Is that damaged, uh, can it be repaired? Repair yourself, or is that just like? Yes, I don't have I don't have a like a research study to cite to confirm that because the, to confirm this diagnosis is a pretty complicated um, medical process. But your body's always turning over, and this is think of like your skin always regenerating your, regenerating itself. But the first step in order to repair this process is to avoid the things that are irritating it and opening it up. And then you need to make sure you're providing yourself all the equipment that it needs and the nutrients you need in order to do that. But where the systemic inflammatory process comes in is if something gets in, then your body's going to try to deal with it. It's a foreign body to you. And this is a link where they're finding or they're theorizing that a lot of autoimmune diseases are stemming from this leaky gut problem. And then you start attacking your own cells and stuff like that. So coming back to your question, which is perfect. So what do we do? My first recommendation, if I suspect somebody has a leaky gut problem, is you want to eat whole food. You don't want to eat refined products that come in a box. You want to eat whole fruits and vegetables and healthy sources of protein. That is the absolute first step of doing, providing your body with the nutrients it needs and now you're avoiding the, the irritants, right? So the first step is always eating whole food, and that <coughs> does include fruit, vegetables. You, you need to balance it out. It's not only protein, and it's not only vegetables. And particularly in the world of CrossFit, you need to have the protein, because that's where you're gonna get the muscle repair, but you also need plenty of carbohydrates in their natural form to keep up your energy levels. So the next, that's always what I recommend first, because people don't like to hear what they need to take out. <laughs> but um, you need to regulate your blood, sh blood sugar. A lot of things that are going to be spiking your blood sugar are also going to be gut irritants. Right? You're feeding the wrong type of bacteria in your gut. Um, so you need to remove refined sugars, refined carbohydrates, um, which often includes the gluten-containing grains and things like that. Sodas with the high fructose corn syrup, and then that includes alcohol. <laughs> and here's the problem with alcohol. I, I'm not like the Grim Reaper of alcohol. Like I, I do, but I, I look at sugar the same way. Like you want to kind of be a sugar snob. Like you want to make sure that when you are consuming alcohol that you're getting the, the best because there's a lot of things that we do to our mass produced alcohol now that has different additives, preservatives, colorings, um, things that your body really doesn't know what to do with that information. Not to mention the fact that alcohol is <coughs> through the stomach. It doesn't even get to the small intestines. It bypasses um, your, your primary filtering system who can might guard you from some of the detrimental effects. And it puts a burden on your liver. Now, having said that, take that with a grain of salt. I mean, we have to live our life. But it's also considered sugar. And that's gonna spike, that's gonna spike your blood sugar quicker because it's not even gonna get passed through your filtering systems at all, right? Then, then the refined carbohydrate bread or pasta. So I said, be a sugar snob. You can be an alcohol snob, too. Um, get vitamin D3. The best, there's so much research out there demonstrating the importance of vitamin D in your joint health. And particularly in a world of CrossFit, 
our joints need to be healthy. And we do, that includes <coughs> movement. And, you know, CrossFit here does a really good job of trying to facilitate the movement, healthy movement. But we need, the only way to get it naturally, the best way to get it naturally is through the natural conversion, which is exposure to full spectrum sunlight on your skin. It converts the cholesterol in your blood to vitamin D. And then that also, having vitamin D is critical to absorbing calcium, which is also important for your joints and your bone, bone health, right? Um, and that gets tricky here in the winter months. So uh, some, some things to consider is nutritionally where you can get it. It's not as readily absorbable, and I actually did a personal little experiment for my studies, and I tried to optimize my vitamin D um, nutritionally, eating seafood, I supplemented, and um, I was even doing some organ meats at that time to see if I could get to the recommended daily levels um, for optimal health. And I wasn't even hardly on the board when, when I went through the calculations. I wasn't anywhere near where the recommendations are for vitamin D levels, which is, and I couldn't, if this was during the summer, we were like spending a lot of time out in the sun at, at Tahoe, and I couldn't enter how much time I spent out in the sun. So I, I mean, I think I was okay vitamin D3 at that time, but from a nutritional standpoint, I wasn't anywhere near where I was theoretically supposed to be from the recommended daily allowance. Go ahead. So, so if you apply a lot of sunscreen, does that inhibit your D3? Yes. That will impair your absorption. <laughs> yeah. So a fair-skinned person like myself, it, it depends on your latitude, it depends on your skin color, it depends on how much skin you have exposed. But say for me, and I tend to burn pretty easily, I would need to have three eight-minute stints in full-spectrum sun, wearing shorts and a t-shirt or tank top to get the 2,000 IUs I think it is that you need. And so for somebody who has darker skin, it would take probably a little bit longer. Now, if I went and spent 30 minutes straight midday sun up at Tahoe, I would burn. So I, you have to think about that. Like, so I go out, I try to get a few minutes, and then I put my sunblock on. Because you don't want to burn. I don't, I don't want skin cancer, I just want vitamin D3, right? So it's something to consider. And it's tricky, like I said, this time of year, we're all covered up. And so I do recommend, at that point, supplementing directly with, I, let me be clear, when I did my experiment, I was not supplementing directly with vitamin D3. I was just trying to eat the foods that were supposed to be high in vitamin D3. So does sun, sun clock, does it just, um, can you not absorb D3 at all or it just inhibits it? So if I were to go out, if, if I were to go out in the middle of summer and I spent four hours in the sun and peeing, which is not uncommon for me, mm -hmm. I don't burn, and I put sunblock on maybe twice, am I? Twice in the day? Yeah. Um, it depends. You know, if you... I would say, from what I've read, it does inhibit your ability to absorb it. But it doesn't but stop it completely. Probably not. But you're also probably not getting it on every single inch of your body, right? So you're still probably exposed. And at some point, if you put it on once in the morning, towards the midday, and if you've been swimming and sweating, like it's probably worn off a bit. Um, but, it, you know, it depends. It depends on where you are, how close you are to the sun, what time of day it is. But it's an interesting problem, right? It's something to think about because we, we don't we don't get enough vitamin and I'm coming at it, I'm not coming at it from skin cancer because I'm not a doctor right I'm coming at it from joint health and the research I've done as far as there's been a lot of associations with deficiencies in vitamin D and carpal tunnel syndrome um, other rheumatoid arthritis type conditions and so from a physical therapy perspective you know when I started to look at it I'm like well I don't I mean, I was always been scared of this stuff but I burn so I have to be careful burn pretty easily. But when I go out like up in Tahoe, I we get there early enough in the day so I can spend 20, 30 minutes out in the sun and then I lotion up. Um, and I try to do that more consistently. But mm -hmm. like I don't put some on my face every morning I go out when it's winter anymore. So would you say you'd recommend, uh, you know, in the winter when we're just not going to get much sun exposure, you'd recommend some sort of like supplement like the, the D3 Pills. And, I mean, eating foods that are high in D3, but you're saying even that's not going to get you close. No, and it's not optimal. 
right? So you're, it's, it's still not going to be the same. You might not get to the same levels, and there's question about how well you're going to absorb it. Mm -hmm. But you, you have to pair it with a healthy fat because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. Mm -hmm. um, but and during the winter, and like for people who work inside all the time and never get outside, I do recommend vitamin D3 supplementation or talking to your doctor about getting on a good one. Because there, there's also links to other, uh, just mental health too. I mean, it, it acts more like a hormone than it is a simple vitamin. So do you recommend uh, combining that with fish oil since it's fat soluble? You can. I mean, uh, I think liver, a lot of fish cod liver, added, cod right? liver oil is a, is a good supplement. You just have to make sure that you're getting cod liver oil <coughs> from a, a good source because a lot of times they can go rancid really easily. Mm. Um, and where are they getting the cod liver from? You want it sourced pretty well. So me personally, I do the vitamin D3 with, it has, with, has coconut oil or olive oil in it to make it fat soluble. Mm -hmm. um, and I do it for my husband because he's, he's in the hospital all the time, year round. Right. So he doesn't, and especially this time of year, he, he goes weeks without seeing the sun. Right. So yeah, for sure. That, that is a supplement that, um, you know, you can eat the mushrooms till your cows come home and you still might not meet their requirements. <laughs> Can you get can you get the same type of degree exposure from a sunlit? It's interesting. I've been meaning to um, look into that. Um, I asked a family member of mine who's a primary care physician. I asked him a question because I have a friend who lives in Indiana, Indianapolis. And he's from Hawaii, like so. He, you know, his ethnic background dictates that he usually probably spent a lot of time in the sun, and now he's in Indianapolis. And he goes to the tanning salon. Mm -hmm. Now, tanning salons have been highly associated with skin cancer. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer because I think based on this lifestyle and food stuff that we're talking about, I, I can't answer that specifically. But they use, they call it heliotherapy for people who have um, affective, you know, seasonal affective disorder. There's a guy in my office that comes from Alaska, mm -hmm. and he he could only reason he survived the winter. And people, a lot in the Midwest have them. Yeah. So I think, I haven't come across those studies, what I'm saying, but I think it probably helped because clearly people need it and people are suffering from problems with it. So I have a little spec, little bit of sun lamp or whatever because I think when we don't see the sun, like, I tend to start to get really bummed out. And I just have it on for a few minutes. I, I don't think it's converting the vitamin D directly from my skin, but I'm not in a but I think from a um, circadian rhythm and a hormonal brain cycle, yeah, I think it helps. So it's an interesting problem, right? Um, you want to eat healthy fat, and that goes along with the importance, tie into the importance of absorbing the vitamin D that you do intake. It has to be paired with um, healthy fat for absorption. Vitamin A, D, and K are all critically important for joint health. Um, healthy fat. Um, is a great source, as you guys probably already know, being familiar with paleo, is a good source for sustained energy. Um, so that's really important for uh, intense activity. You want to be able to get through it and not conk out right in the middle. You need healthy fat for hormonal production. That's really important for women, particularly of, of all ages, but particularly of the, young, the younger reproductive ages. Um, Sustained energy we talked about. And there's been an old adage that the fat that we eat will make us fat, and that is entirely false. Now, if you ate fat 100% of the, your day, all day long, and overconsumed cat, like significantly overconsumed calories, you would. But generally, if you include healthy fats, it tends to fill you up. You're a slower burn of energy. It doesn't spike your insulin, so you're not eating as much of it. Keep your gut healthy. If we go back to the what we talked about earlier and the picture of um, Dr. Sarah and Valentine's gut, we talked about um, making sure we take care of that gut lining. I said the first step is eating whole foods, but the next step would be avoiding um, microbiome disruptors. And those things are the refined sugars, high fructose corn syrup, all types disrupting your um, microbiome. 
artificial sweeteners have also. So aspartame especially disrupts, you know, in the diet soda world, disrupts your microbiome. Trans fatty acids, we know that as uh, canola oil, I can't believe it's not butter. Um, <laughs> those are in a lot of those refined <coughs> carbohydrate foods, crackers, pastries, even in breads and stuff. So if you are, are avoiding and avoiding processed food and eating whole foods, you're already doing a, a great job of avoiding those things that would disrupt that microbiome. Pharmaceuticals, now I'm not a doctor. Everyone, if you are on prescription medications, you do need to discuss this with your doctor. Um, however, there have been links to NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are heavily used over-the-counter medications. And probably in a gym like CrossFit, um, and in my world as physical therapy, everyone was coming in and taking anti-inflammatories. We take them like candy you know, to manage different joint pains. Um, the other one that's really important here to bring up, because it's also incredibly common, is birth control pills. A lot of women, at a long, young, starting at a really young age, are already on it, and that's been associated with disruption of the microbiome, but also inflammatory markers, even well after cessation of the of taking the pill. So, if you are on certain pharmaceuticals, the other one was statins for blood control, blood pressure control. Again, talk to your doctor, but if you do nothing else, you keep everything the same and you switch your diet from heavily processed, refined carbohydrate foods to whole foods, you will be making a dramatic impact and trying to improve that. And you may improve some of your pain conditions and you recover your inflammatory process from the CrossFit that wouldn't require having to feel like you need to take them. Um, eating probiotic rich foods. Um, is another way to re-inoculate. So if you've disrupted that balance and you want to re-inoculate eating probiotic rich foods, but also eating raw fruits and vegetables from, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, but like from the farmer's market, you know, because the, <clears throat> the bugs that are associated from the soils are the ones that you actually want to reside in there. Um, consider taking probiotic supplementation if, um, you've had heavy use of NSAIDs in your past, or even antibiotics, So alternatives to the NSAID, this is a, a diagram of the inflammatory pathway directly related to osteoarthritis and where certain nutraceuticals, natural components from food, um, and where they can slow that inflammatory process down. So if your inflammatory process, if you're in a systemic inflammatory state because you're on a heavily refined, refined sugar state, um, and you're looking to calm it down, the NSAIDs block it, right? So the non steroidal anti-inflammatories will block it at a certain, there's a lot of COX-2 inhibitors, but you could also have curry, curcumin and turmeric in resveratrol from berries. You know, increasing your whole foods components will slow it down. To make it stop it, the way like an NSAID would, you have to take it at a therapeutic dose in a pill. Like you wouldn't be able to eat enough curcumin or turmeric alone. But if you change all these other components, these things will regulate it. It won't stop your inflammatory process. And again, I, I mentioned this earlier, your inflammatory, you want your body to respond when it's injured. You don't want it not to respond. You want it to respond because you do like if you, you know, you get the, ankle sprain, you want your body to send the cells in there that it needs to, to start repairing things. You wanna get back to normal movement so you can get back to that <coughs> you want. You don't wanna stop it altogether, right? And here's my, my last specific tip um, for things to include for nutrition is you wanna drink bone broth, mineral broth, and water. Bone broth is high in bioavailable nutrients, the collagen, and I think if we go back to the slide, the above here, um, it has the glucosamine and glutarate and sulfate. That supplement has been around forever, forever, and it's been touted as joint health, um, and been used a lot in animals. And the way to get that in a natural, whole foods version would be making bone broth, and you're using the joints of, say, a chicken carcass, um, using the long bones to get the marrow from long bones from um, well-sourced, you know, grass-fed, organic beef bones. 
And calcium, that's another big one that's important for that joint health we were talking about, along with that vitamin D3. You need both of those. Um, but this brings it into a bioavailable form. You need mineral broth is just a veg thing, vegetable broth. So it just brings you in different um, water-soluble vitamins and minerals that are more readily bioavailable. I kind of think of it as like your electrolyte drink in its nat most natural form, even though drinking mineral broth or vegetable broth cold doesn't sound too appealing, but it's an option. So Super makes bone broth, and I hate the taste by itself. Um, what kind of volume are you thinking? And, and if it's a low enough volume, couldn't we just like, you know, prepare the bone broth and then mix it into like, you know, soups and things like that? 100%. Okay. I don't like the taste of it personally either. And when I make um, the recipe I have up on my, on my blog site for bone broth, I like the flavor and the smell of the chicken broth, and then I'll throw a beef bone in. Because that, the beef broth, I think it smells horrendously awful. Yeah, and like, it I like gags me. Yeah, I can't really. Um, so it still doesn't smell pleasant while you're making it, but it makes a killer soup. Yeah. And so like this time of year, I make soups twice a week. <clears throat> and then I alternate between um, the bone broth and using the vegetable base mineral broth because it's a little bit lighter. I find if I do the bone broth all the time, it's just, it's a little it's so bit too rich. much. It's so rich. It's like and overly it's, rich when I drink and that, it. And so that's where I start to feel like I tip my balance into too much fat, too. Right. Like, I, I, it starts to drag me down. It slows me down because it's a lot of work for our body to process all the fat. So we need to make it easy sometimes. And that's where the mineral broth really helps. Does gelatin fit into this? Gelatin, yep. Mm -hmm. okay. from the, the well, that comes from the long bones and the bone marrow. It's where a lot of the gelatin and all the joints depend on. <coughs> so how about the gelatin? <coughs> You can. I tend to try to shy away from the supplementation version because it's more of a refined product versus its natural version. Um, Is it one of those things you can't get enough of and maybe you should supplement or you think you... Um, it depends. Okay. It depends on what your goal is. If you really are like at CrossFit two, three times a day and you're just going <laughs> crazy with it and you're doing it all the time and you're trying to build and build and you really need to build bulk and strength, then you might want to be, then you might need supplementation because you just might not be able to eat enough to keep, your body can't keep up with that sort of thing. But from a long, from like a sustainable lifestyle, I regularly have this as part of my diet. I don't do it every day. It's part of my family's diet. We have a soup at least once a week, depending. During the summer, it's a little less often, but during the winter, I mean, that's like my go-to of my soup. And, and I, you know, if you are gonna have grains, we talked about not having the refined grains, I recommend making your rice, brown rice, <coughs> traditionally from an organic, non-GMO source, and then you put it in the first. This is how you make it with your Bone broth and bone broth, for sure. So I don't drink it straight like coffee. I know people that do. I can't seem to stomach it that way. But soups, um, it, it's a great thing to have in the repertoire. And if you have had a crazy workout and you're feeling really sore, you want to try to incorporate something like this the day after or that night. Because I do think it helps. It helps your gut. This will help your gut healing too. Bone broth. With all the gelatin and the collagen will help give your gut that equipment. Um, another interesting thing is about drinking water, um, which we probably don't do enough of because either we're too busy or we're having, you know, we're, we're trying to overcompensate and have those hydration drinks because we think we need that. The International Society of Sports Nutrition, ISSN, I forget what exactly it stands for. But they have taken a stand on the energy drinks and the hydration drinks and given a big caution to using those because the caffeine and the caffeine can impair your motor performance. They're in a lot of those. But the high sugar, I mean, comes back to that metabolic syndrome and that systemic inflammatory issue. And so when people ask me too, coming back to the collagen or um, having a supplement, when, if you're gonna use a protein supplement, be real careful about what's in it. Because, you know, if you can eat steak 
if you need protein, you should eat a little bit of steak if that's what your body needs versus the refined protein. Because I can't, you can't guarantee one, it's not gonna have foreign material that might cause a different issue, but it doesn't look natural and you just don't know what your body's gonna do. Is it gonna look like a foreign thing? Do you happen to have leaky gut? Um, and along those lines, probably for the chicken would really make a difference where you, you get, I used to get the rotisserie chickens at Costco and make bone broth out of it, but they're full of carrying in and they're not organic, right? So if you're getting bone broth from a chicken, you probably want to get a Yeah, chicken. you know, it's hard because you, at some point you have to be able to just live life, right? But there are organic whole chickens you can get at Costco. Um, and then I would, I make a rotisserie type chicken at home in the crock pot, and then I keep all my stuff from that, and then I make the bone broth. My beef bones, I do get from a local farmer in town, because I don't go through them very quickly. And you can reuse those, too. You, like the first time you get all the marrow out, but then as you keep cooking them, and you can get more of the calcium out of the bones. And so they can last. Yeah. They, well, traditionally, they used to pass them around the neighborhood. One person would make their batch and then go, okay, here you go. Here's <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. I'll go first. So what about uh, bubble water? Is that good or bad for you? Like We're addicted. <laughs> bubbly water. Just like mineral, like crystal yeah. geyser or mineral yeah. waters. Um, you know, you'd have to look at what the contents are in it. And I'm not against the, the bubbly waters and the mineral waters, but I think you just have to, you know, again, is it a natural version? Is it an unnatural version of it? It's interesting because you bring up the addictive piece to it. Mm -hmm. um, you've read the Power of Habit book, mm -hmm. right? And they talk about toothpaste yeah. and how they develop that, um, having the peppermint, the, the bubble, and the time of day. So you've got the time of day triggering a habit, then you've got the physical sensation, mm -hmm. right, of the bubbles and the mm -hmm. minty. And I was thinking about soda. I mean, soda's the same way in anything bubbly. You've got that central nervous system stimulant. Mm -hmm. And if there's a time of day that you tend to crave it, it's driven by that. So, <laughs> so um, I don't generally drink sodas. I have a soda stream so I can make some bubbly water or mineral water. I'm not like against it necessarily, but you know, they're, they're marketing to you for sure. Oh, I mean, sure. They're playing that game. I think for us, it's been mostly a uh, substitution from you know getting away from it's a great budgeting strategy, yeah. certainly, certainly. And I recommend that a lot for people who are addicted to a lot of diet soda or um, soda pop, because you get one of those bubbly mineral waters that doesn't have, it's mm -hmm. not too bad just to sort of bridge your gap until you can sort of wean yourself mm -hmm. out of that habit. So eating strategy, what do you eat? Um, you've guys seen the food plate, the new food pyramid that's in the form of the plate. My recommendation is your food plate should have some animals on it and it should have on it. And the plants need to include fruits and vegetables. If grains or legumes really need to be a part of your life because of their hard, high carbohydrate um, content, you just need to get them in their best form and you absolutely need to make them traditional. So that's soaking, fermenting, sprouting, and then making them. I mean, it takes, it's a process, but we need, that's sort of where I'm at. If you're gonna do it, you need to do it and then make it with mineral or bone broth. Um, the ratios depends on your lifestyle, right? I mean, you, you can't live in the CrossFit world and be doing CrossFit and have zero protein. Zero animals. I mean, you're not going to be able to sustain the, this level of activity. But you don't necessarily need more animals than plants, depending on what you're doing. It's just sort of it's a balance. You have to kind of fill. But when you look at your plate, you just it's not. So I don't look at it as fat, carbs, and and things like that. I just okay. I got my Mostly plants, and then I have some some protein, and I try to make my best choices that I can with either what's available or making it. When do you want to eat? Is another question, and this comes up to this intermittent fasting piece. My recommendation is you need to eat when you're hungry, just like you need to drink when you're thirsty. You need to, when you're hungry is when you eat, and when you're not hungry is when you stop. You don't need to eat every two hours necessarily, except that's where your metabolism really is at. If you're really working out a lot, you do tend to need to up your calories. And when you're eating whole foods, it, that's a lot of, you're eating a lot that day if you're really keeping up that level of activity. But um, as far as coming back to that inflammatory state that we were talking about, intermittent fasting, um, as defined as just extending the intervals between eating, 
uh, really helps regulate that inflammatory response and facilitates the healing response. It also allows your body to kind of take a break from digesting and start working on other stuff, filtering things out, get, you know, detoxifying your body through the liver. But when you're constantly eating, your body's always working on that part and, and it's just kind of pausing on everything else. Intermittent fasting can be, you stop eating at six o'clock at night and you don't eat breakfast till you know, nine or 10 in the morning, you know, where you, you can narrow that eating window so it's not a full fast. Um, <coughs> fasting, I think we've talked about this, but fasting can be productive, particularly for men, as far as there's been a, a few studies done on um, Ramadan, men during fasting during Ramadan and having um, mental improvement. It's, it's very interesting how that works. For women, you gotta be really careful with the fasting, particularly if you're nursing, with, you know, reproductive age and those things, I don't generally recommend that. But extending your eating, you know, narrowing your eating window and extending your intermittent fasting so you're, you know, you're going to bed on an empty stomach, you wake up in a you know, keto, ketotic type state, um, has, has really good, um, there's plenty of new studies coming out showing that that's productive. And if you wonder, is it safe eating whole foods and avoiding gluten and grains and refined carbohydrates? A study done by um, Terry Walls, she wasn't the lead author on it, but you guys may have heard of the Walls Protocol, where she reversed her multiple sclerosis. In order to start doing clinical studies on patients, you have to first demonstrate you can do, you're not doing any harm. So a lot of people like, well, it's not safe not to eat carbohydrates. Well, you're still eating carbs if you're eating plants. You're still getting carbs. So it's not about not carbs, it's just avoiding the refined stuff. So in summary, and we're almost done here, guys. Um, to optimize your performance, you want to remove refined flours, refined sugars, especially uh, vegetable oils, processed foods, and unnecessary medications under a physician's guidance. You want to replace with whole organic produce, um, fish, healthy fats, meats, and drink plenty of fresh water along with bone broth and mineral oil. And you want to restore a healthy inflammatory response, immune system, strong muscles, and maybe, <laughs> we'll see, I got, so you don't want to eat those, eat that, and maybe you'll be able to do more of that. <laughs> so go AMRAP. <laughs> as many rounds as possible. Um, if you want to follow any, like I try to post um, updates on different topics on my blog, on my website, under the How to Soar tab at greenosoar.com. Um, and if you do Facebook, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Any questions? You know, you talked about on the joints, uh, collagen and things like that. Mm -hmm. I know you won't suggesting more whole food, but if we need to kind of push more into intake of that, is is that helpful for joints? And if so, I mean, some of that powder stuff is also okay. Uh, again, remember the chondroitin and the <coughs> sulfate, those ones, the, most of the research I've come across with those have demonstrated just like that diagram, that they have an anti-inflammatory effect. It's not that they're repairing your joints. Does that make sense? They block a pathway, mm -hmm. essentially, or at least slow it down. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, right, so they're, they're gonna um, slow it down here at this level. So they're slowing the inflammatory process down. I have not come across, I'm not against the supplementation. I think that there's a place for it but I don't generally recommend it unless say you've made all these other changes and then you're still having pain. Or you know, then is there a different issue that requires physical therapy or something like that. You know, but for sure, the glucosamine and chondroitin, there's been, I mean, animals have been on this, dogs have been on this stuff for ever. I mean, many, many years before I think even humans started um, taking it. So, would I say, yeah, go ahead. If you're having joint pain, you make some of these other changes, and then maybe you're, for a while you're doing the cup of bone broth every day, if you can handle it, or you're making a soup from it. But remember, your body's gonna prioritize, right? You, 
can't necessarily make it go straight to your knee. That's where your problem is. Your body is going to prioritize about what's more cr critical as far as that repair process. And so it may take time before you really start to see the benefits. So like the systemic inflammation, um, a lot of times we don't, would you say, most of us don't even really realize that we're suffering from it because it's internal. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I was trying. What I Would you say, say I did say? <laughs> what I wanted to say about that was the systemic inflammation will get you every time because it's often subclinical. Right. It takes years maybe before you start to notice it. Right. So if if people don't like, so I I was going to ask you about gout. Um, so people that suffer from gout, is that generally uh, they have systemic inflammation and then it presents itself locally? At just that's the flare up, but they but it's an underlying problem that just exists all the time. Is that basically the deal? Yeah, and there's a reason why it's off, it's also often associated with alcoholism, right? So you clearly, if you're an alcoholic, you have an infl systemic inflammatory process going on. Your liver is burdened, and and you're probably not having an um, optimal diet on top of being an alcoholic. So there's you have a systemic process going on for sure. And then you have, it's a great case of, then it tips the balance, right? Like your body can't sort of sustain itself and then you start exposing um, symptoms. But they likely have symptoms. They're just either not paying attention to it, subclinical, you know, but they probably associated with morbid obesity and right. diabetes. And so they have other chronic diseases that are associated with it. Those are all associated with the inflammatory conditions, right? So subclinical, it's probably not subclinical by the time you get Right. right. We were on the slide before. You said you were talking about all of these things, and you said you probably you would maybe take it if you have an issue at therapeutic levels. Right. So, so that, what does that look like? Not so, for food, right? Yeah. So like resveratrol is a component of berries, like blueberries, say. And so, you, in order to really say stop this pathway. Right, like if this is the inflammatory pathway you're trying to get at to really block it because they think that's where your problem is, you couldn't just eat a couple blueberries a day to get that effect. You, you'd have to take some sort of supplement to get to a therapeutic dose, which is more like pharmaceutical type stuff, is, is what I was getting at. So then that's where um, you would need to take a supplement, right, at, at, at a therapeutic level, whatever that is. I, I couldn't tell you what that is. But you could still eat the blueberry. Right. Right? And it, and it may not be, um, it may not be that that's, and, and this is, the inflammatory process is normal. You don't want it out of hand, and you might need help to slow it down a bit. But if you make the other lifestyle changes, that may be enough to slow this down. Right? And I think that's where most of the benefits come from. <coughs> Like paleo, or some of any eating strategy. I mean, what they have most in common is most of them include more whole food products than they do refined, um, high sugar. You know, they all cut out sugar. You know, for the most part, they all cut out a significant amount of refined sugars. You know, so there's the reason why they're all successful, right? Because they have a lot of common links that calm this inflammatory process down. Yeah, it's Dr. Terry Walls, W H W A H L S, and she has a YouTube video and she um, talks about her recovery from not recovery because she still has MS. She's just reversed a lot of her symptoms because it's a you know. Anyways, but she has a YouTube video, Dr. Terry Walls. It, it's phenomenal. She has a book and she's continuing to do. And she's a physician. She's an MD. So she's been doing studies on um, MS, and I think she started including Parkinson's disease. So doing uh, Paleolithic type nutrition strategies. MS is the breakdown of the myelin sheath around the, the nervous system. Is that the, mm -hmm. the condition? Okay. And so basically through inflammation and mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory well, response, it's she was that probably getting more of autoimmune disease, right? Oh, it is. Okay. MS and Parkinson's and even um, Alzheimer's. Rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, right. chronic um, autoimmune diseases. 
And so the theoretical construct that they're trying to validate behind a lot of those diseases is via you know, the leaky gut problem. Mm -hmm. That right. your, you, your body, if you have a leaky gut, stuff starts getting into your body that shouldn't be there. Your body responds with an you know, inflammatory response and starts attacking your own um, thyroid disorders, mm -hmm. autoimmune, mm -hmm. Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think what I want to, you had a question about how do you heal that. I think the first step is always removing the things that are aggravating it, for one. And then you start to give your body what it needs to repair itself. The body will repair itself. How far you've gone into that disease process depends on how much you can recover, because there are times where damage has been done. I mean, like your ACL, if you tear your ACL, your body's not going to like run you into ACL, no matter how well you eat. There are certain limitations to that. And you do, but you can optimize your recovery from having to have surgery, for sure, by taking some of these things that don't count. Any other questions? No, those are good. Oh, thank you. Thank All you. right. Thank you.